Hey there, welcome to Takeaway with Sam Okus, a podcast from Nation's Restaurant News. I am Sam Okus, Editor-in-Chief here at NRN, and this is the show where I give you an all-access pass to the restaurant industry's most influential decision makers. This week, I'm talking with Clay Walker, the president of Gott's Roadside, a burger joint that is celebrating 25 years serving Northern California consumers and tourists alike uh, with a wine country picnic experience. Experience. Now with eight locations, Gotts specializes in high quality burgers, sandwiches, salads, and hot dogs, alongside an impressive lineup of wines and beers, all of it in a casual counter service setting that is as much outside as it is in. Clay joined the podcast to talk about Gotts' methodic approach to growth and its efforts to bottle that wine country aesthetic that can help it grow beyond its Northern California roots. In this conversation, you will learn more about how counter service and picnic tables are perfectly acceptable for elevated food, why you must learn to be patient if you want to be the best at what you do, and why timing is everything with succeeding as a brand. Jumping now into my interview with Gotts Roadside President Clay Walker. Also, don't forget to stick around after the interview as I will share my six takeaways from this discussion, actionable insights that you can take with you on the go. Okay, I'm here with Clay Walker, the president of the California burger concept, Gotts Roadside. Clay, thanks for joining me today. Sam, it's a pleasure. All right, so Clay, um, Gotts Roadside, as we'll get into, this brand um, is a very meaningful to me. I love this brand, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's regional. It's in, out in California, so I'm sure a lot of the listeners are not familiar. What's the quick synopsis of what this brand is all about? So Gotts Roadside is, is a roadside stand concept that's been serving the California roadside since 1999. And, but we're not just an ordinary burger joint. We do pride ourselves on having, you know, one of the best burger lineups, um, in the area. And we're, we're written up in a lot of the, the, uh, best ofs nationwide, but really what distinguishes Gotts is the breadth of menu. So in addition to burgers, there's all kinds of um, great salads and and fresh seafood and a really uh, wonderful craft beer and wine list um, that that is um, more extensive than one typically finds at a fast casual concept. And in addition to that, um, we really pride ourselves on over the top hospitality. So mm-hmm. while it is a counter service uh, concept, we, uh, really go the extra mile in terms of making people feel welcome and comfortable during their stay And it. And it just results in really memorable, um, dining experiences that people want to repeat. And we're kind of that neighborhood gathering spot, uh, for every community in which we reside. Sure. So lots there I want to unpack. Um, but before that, you know, you're, you're closing in on a quarter century, um, which is is great and impressive. Um, you yourself have been with this brand, I think about a decade. Um, tell me how you got to Gots. Tell me about your career and what led you to this brand. So, correct. I've been here exactly 10 years. And next year, 2024, will be Gots 25th anniversary. Um, so exciting times for us. Uh, big milestone. I've been in this business for approximately 30 years. And after college, I, I joined the corporate workforce as a management consultant, um, but didn't really find um, that to be as exciting as I had hoped and decided to um, start a restaurant concept with a high school friend of mine uh, called the Emerald Planet. And that opened in 1996. Uh, in Greenwich Village, right around the corner from NYU. And it was really um, classic California-inspired food. Um, Fresh burritos and fruit smoothies. And believe it or not, this was before Chipotle and Jamba Juice had entered the East Coast market. So my, my high school friend and I grew up eating that type of food. I mean, in, in growing up in California, just kind of like 
you know, in Philly, it's cheesesteaks and, you know, New York, it's pizza and hot dogs in California. It's yeah. burritos. I mean, that's what we grew up on mm -hmm. um, and blended fruit drinks. And uh, we missed that when we both went back east to college. And so, you know, we'd complain about the food and, you know, always fantasized about starting a restaurant concept someday. And that opportunity came earlier than we ever thought when we both found our initial corporate jobs out of college um, less than satisfying. And so we took the plunge. Um, that's how I got mm. into the business. Um, ended up growing that business um, to three different units. Just to give you a little bit of time frame, there was another darling concept in New York City at the time called Cozy Sandwich Bar. Oh, sure. If you recall them, um, mm -hmm. they were contemporaries um, and friends of ours, right? I mean, we we met a lot of people in the industry and I'm still in touch with many of them. And in fact, our culinary director today is somebody I uh, used to run around with in those, in those restaurant circles in New York back in the day. Um, but 9-11 crushed my Emerald Planet dreams in essence. Um, mm -hmm. We were mm -hmm. literally um, in late stage negotiations for a lease in the World Trade Center. Um, and unfortunately, the people uh, besides me and my attorney um, are no longer living. And that was a pretty dramatic wow. um, experience, obviously, for the world. Um, but that's my personal yeah. anecdote. Um, you know, the restaurants, uh, you know, obviously that the economy changed quickly and we were able to hang on, but we went from what I thought was a fast growing brand to a fast shrinking brand, um, just because we weren't that well capitalized. Mm -hmm. Um, but so it goes right. And mm -hmm. I ended up selling that, uh, business, fortunately, um, not, not the exit that we were originally looking for, but, um, you know, was able to, to still tie a bow on it. I then mm -hmm. went to go work for a, one of the hedge, uh, private equity firms that I pitched trying to raise money, uh, for the Emerald planet read in the newspaper that, that the Emerald planet had been sold. And I, I got a cold call from one of the principals who had just taken a majority interest in a local brand called Papaya King which you've probably heard of the, oh, yeah. the, the old sure. hot dog, uh, Emporium. And I was at, he said, are you a free agent? And I said, I, <laughs> yes, but I'm, I just sold my business and my wife and I just had our first child literally right at the same week. So my life was wow. pretty chaotic. And, but I ended up, you know, a month later starting to consult and I, I came on, uh, to that team as the director of operations and marketing. And of course, a lot of my foodie friends were like, what are you doing peddling tube steaks? Um, <laughs> but, but it's this iconic brand, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that generations of New Yorkers had grown up with. I mean, it's an incredible immigrant story. Um, and it's just, and it's still there today. I mean, I, yeah. I still hit it when I'm back in New York. Um, and, it just kind of further cemented my my love for the business. I did take um, we started a franchise program, which was a great experience for me, and you know grew it from up to ten units in a couple of years. And um, but I I did have an opportunity to diversify, and so I I stepped out of the restaurant industry. Um, again, this is when I had young kids, just trying to find some sanity, and I yeah. I stepped into the real estate side of the business. Um, so I joined the team that managed all the leasing and retail at Grand Central Terminal. And okay. um, that a big real estate services firm called Jones Lang LaSalle had that contract at the time. So I, ended, I joined their retail group and worked at their trophy property. Um, and I was brought on because all the the first 10 year leases were on the verge of expiring. Mm. And so they wanted a local operator who knew a lot of the, the restaurant 
folks in town, but could also interface, you know, wearing a suit with the MTA and, you know, all the other stakeholders. So it was kind of a dream job for me because it was very mayor esque. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the operators that I knew were really surprised to see me in a suit on the other side of the table. They're like, you, you joined the evil empire. And I said, <laughs> no, I'm actually here to help raise all boats. Um, which is really cool because those are all percent rent deals. So, you know, the, mm. the, the better the tenants do the, the more money the landlords make too. I I'm a big fan of those types of arrangements because everybody's, you know, got skin in the game, got skin in the game. Exactly. And so, yeah. That was a couple years, um, and then I had an opportunity um, to move back to California, um, and that was during the '09 recession. And so we we lifted up stakes, and I I moved my family of four, soon to be five, back to California, where I'm from originally. Um, and so it was a little bit of a reboot. Um, I was planning on an, literally an intercompany transfer through my employer, Jones Lang LaSalle. They wanted to start up a big retail practice in San Francisco. Mm. Um, and so I was identified as that person. Uh, but things changed quickly in the economy and that opportunity, you know, rather than bring people on, they were laying people off. And so I went back to my restaurant roots and start consulting. And that's really how I found my way to, to God's. I had been a customer over the years, many times. Um, but that's how I had the opportunity to, to reconnect with, um, Joel got and, you know, identified an opportunity for me to lend a helping hand. And that was approximately 10 years ago. Oh, it's so interesting, and, and you've had such a an interesting path to this position. And just looking at this, I mean, you had the entrepreneurial position of launching your own restaurant. You had the more operational uh, at, at Papaya King, and being able, you know, having to be more operational minded. I'm sure at that brand and, and, and strategic thinking. Then, of course, uh, with Grand Central, that is real estate and partnership. I, it just seems like you have had so many interesting experiences. And I'm curious, like if you were to deduce what you've pulled from your past that you brought with you to God's, like, is there anything in particular that you feel like those experiences like shaped you in any way? That's a loaded question, Sam. Um, we're all, products, <laughs> Hey, we can unpack it all, together. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we're, we're all products of our own experience, right? I mean, that's, that is yeah. the human condition. And yes, I've, um, I've done some corporate and some startup. Um, and, and like you said, everything in between, you know, I, I got into the food business as an entrepreneur, um, and lived, um, you know, very simply in those years, because there just simply wasn't enough cash being thrown off from the business to, to compensate the founders very well. But that also, you know, it, it's kind of a mini American dream story, right? Um, you know, you, you take a little risk and, and see where it goes. While that first venture didn't end quite the way I had hoped it would, um, you know, it's, it's, you, ha you can't be afraid to fail right in life. Um, and so, you know, I, I think I've been steeled by all of these different experiences. There's, there have been elements of success in every single one of them, um, and elements of, of failure. Right. And, and I do, you know, I used to poo poo that management consulting experience out of college, but in certain ways it was kind of, it was almost a finishing school. Um, mm coming out of college because, you know, consulting firms, it, it's put you through a boot camp, right? And teach you how to be professional. And you get crash courses in different industries, depending on what projects you're assigned to. And then it's um, 
do your best to be an expert <laughs> out of the gates. And right. so, you know, it, it takes a lot of poise. Um, and, and so, you know, all of, all of those experiences, um, ha have been instrumental in kind of getting me to, to where I am today. I, I would say, you know, hospitality, it's, it's a pretty crazy business depending on, you know, where you are in it. I've never wanted to be in the fine dining business or the bar business. I've always been attracted probably because it, it came to light when I was in my early twenties in between fine dining and fast food, you know, that what, what's today called fast casual, but, right. um, it's that, it's that niche in between that I've always been really excited about. Um, and so I've never, you know, had to be the bartender dealing with drunks <laughs> at night. Right. Mm -hmm. I, it, I, I've been able to lead a shockingly nine to five life. Um, you know, I, I put in a lot more hours than that for sure, but more like where I want to, right. I, I worked remotely before it was defined that way. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's, it's been a, a pretty interesting, um, road for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say, you know, what the way I describe God's kind of in that continuum is, you know, I went from corporate, which was, you know, just, it, it, it wasn't, um, focused enough for me mm -hmm. where I just didn't, I, I was never emotionally invested. Um, then I went to startup Ville, but had a really hard time making a living. Right. And yeah. supporting a family. And so, you know, God's is kind of somewhere in the middle too, where I, I refer to it as a, as a mature startup. Hmm. You know, hmm. we, when I joined, there were three restaurants. Um, there are now eight restaurants and, you know, we're hoping to be embarking on our next growth spurt coming up here. Um, if, you know, interest rates can ever come down. <laughs> That's a big if, <laughs> although right. who knows in 2024. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's been the last several years have been somewhat aging for all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, trying to, to keep a, a restaurant business flowing with all of those uh, challenges has been, you know, quite an experience, uh, a lot of pain, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a little bit like, you know, how athletes train at high altitude with, with ankle weights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that when they get back down to sea level, everything seems easier. It's easy. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like, I, you know, we've all been wearing ankle weights, uh, <laughs> over the last few years. Um, you know, I think we're just starting to feel what it's like to not have those, but then all of a sudden, you know, inflation rears its ugly head and, um, people, I, what I love is that people are just kind of refusing to accept it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, traffic at restaurants has been surprisingly strong, not across the board, but um, stronger than everybody anticipated given, um, you know, all the inflationary pressure. Sure. Which we're very yeah. grateful for. Yeah. Well, I love that analogy, by the way, of the ankle weights. I actually use a similar analogy, which is um, the donut on the baseball bat when, you know, the, the batter is on deck and they're <laughs> swinging with that donut, right? I love that analogy because you're so Same right. We're, like, yeah. Same thing. It's it's such a great analogy. So, um, but getting to you know, Gots. I mean, twenty five years almost in eight locations. Um, unpacking this concept a little bit. Um, now, I told you before uh, we hit record about my experience with Gots, which is I've been actually to this to the restaurants many times, particularly the St. Helena location and the Napa City one. And um, I, whenever I'm in Napa, I have to go because I have this really emotional connection to, to the Gotts restaurants there. And uh, I showed you, I have a picture of my, my wife and my daughter when she was a baby there. We, we just had a really great place and a, a great time. And I bring this up mostly because like to me, Gotts is such an emotion 
driven restaurant. It's a it's a it's a memory driven restaurant. And a lot of that hinges on the fact that those locations I've been to are in Napa, which is from this East Coaster heaven. <laughs> I mean, it's it's this wonderful, beautiful place. It's obviously tourism country. And here's this little slice of it that is, uh, to your point, it's fast casual, but it's great hospitality and it's, um, you know, great food. So um, I, I say all that to just sort of set up this idea of what this concept really represents, which obviously serving residents of Napa, serving tourists, I assume. Um, but just to even go even more granular, that concept of roadside, I love the term because it sort of harkens back to like, nostalgia and i'm curious if you can tell me a little bit more about that what do, what does the roadside piece of god's gods really reflect and how do you kind of own up to that piece of it that's, a, that's you you've you've nailed what i think really differentiates gods in in many ways from from other concepts that weren't born rurally what's interesting you know gots is definitely a wine country brand that's what we call ourselves and it's it's about we're all about a wine country picnic experience and wherever we've opened whether it be urban or suburban thereafter we've tried to bottle that magic and take it with us right that's hard to do where you, when you're in a in a strip center, right, um, or at the base of an office building. But there are some elements that and cues that are transportable. Um, and you know, we start with kind of a real indoor outdoor vibe, where all of our restaurants have large outdoor footprints, because that's kind of what our flagship restaurant was all about. And so we're known for that. And, you know, that was very helpful to not only surviving, but thrive, thriving during the pandemic too. Um, it, you know, not only did the climate help, but having those outdoor footprints was incredibly helpful. Um, but, but, you know, Sam, you and your family, when you talk about the experiences you've had at God's, you are our target audience, right? You know, imagine a hot summer day, a family's on a road trip, kids are restless in the back of the car, mom and dad are at their wits end. The doors open, the kids run free. Mom and dad order food for the family while the kids run around. You know, everybody can decompress and enjoy a meal together. So that's kind of what GOTS is all about. It's that casual setting with elevated food and beverages. Uh, you know, not too many burger joints have stemware. So you know, there is a pinky, there's a pinkies out um, <laughs> component. Mm -hmm. and, and we carry that, we bring that everywhere we go because that's, it happened, it, that was not planned. That was just an organic expression of, of where the business started. And so, you know, in the Napa Valley, as you know, there's a, there's a lot of fine dining, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Thomas, Thomas Keller groups up here. Um, and it's, it's pretty fancy where Gots comes in is, is we are the casual break from that. So, People are relieved to come to Goss because they can kind of let their hair down. Um, you know, they can eat comfort food instead of foie gras. Um, you know, it's it's just super casual. Um, it's, you know, under sun, sunny skies, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, but but that's kind of, you know, the gist. It's It's craveable food, which is which is enjoyed at picnic tables and, and GOTS as a concept is just all about being accessible, convenient locations with ample parking, reasonable prices, friendly people, consistent and reliable. Um, just that true neighborhood 
gathering place for the community. And yes, you know, we, we, we serve locals, of course, um, and we serve visitors, you know, whether those are business people or vacationers or just day trippers, right? Mm -hmm. Every location kind of has, there's, there's a lot of demographic overlap. Um, but we, you know, we're seven day a week locations. Um, we're open 363 days a year, um, for lunch and dinner. And, um, you know, we like to be kind of location wise in that cross section of where people, you know, live, work and play, um, play being the tourism or, or pl we have a, our newest location is outside chase center where the golden state warriors play. Oh, sure. Um, you know, the play there are people coming to events at chase center, whether they be warriors games or concerts or whatever. So, um, and, and we bring this wine country vibe wherever we go. And it, and it actually works. Is it as pastoral as St. Helena, California? No, because mm -hmm. there's more, there's more infill and, but, but it's, it's really helped differentiate us as a brand. Um, to the point where we don't really have direct competition. We, we have a lot of competition by menu category, right? It's, you know, most people know us for burgers. Hey, there are a lot of good burger joints, right? Sure. Um, independence and chains, um, you know, by salads, you know, we were next door to a sweet green. Um, and I was wondering how that was going to play out. And you know what? It's just fine. There's room for everybody. Um, but, you know, we sell a lot of salad too. And so, mm -hmm. yes, of course, we compete with sweet green and mixed greens and tender greens and, you know, all those, those salad players. But, you know, we're kind of, we have that breadth of menu under one roof where we like to, you know, joke. It's not really a joke. It's a truism. But, you know, we always um, deliver it to one another internally. There's something for everyone. And I'm there really is. And that's, that's kind of one of the, the biggest changes I made when I joined the company. Okay. So that's interesting. Tell me about that. Because um, when you joined the company, I guess, what was your assessment assessment of what the brand had accomplished and where you thought it could go? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. Um, Gotts is before I joined already had a really loyal following. There were only three locations, but people would make the pilgrimage, um, you know, from, from not only the greater Bay area, but from out of state people like you from Columbus who actually, you know, had that experience. Uh, people want to repeat it, uh, when mm -hmm. they can. Um, but my first, and this is interesting. I started as a consultant with the gods. Oh, okay. um, that's kind of how my engagement started. And so I really, it was fascinating for me because I got to lift up the rug. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I had done this like, you know, at Papaya King, I did something very similar. It was, you know, being run by the great grandson of the founder. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was tasked with professionalizing a family business. Like that's kind of what I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you went into the basement of, you know, the original Papaya King on 86 and third, um, this great grandson, I mean, he's a good operator, but you know, the C, you know, if you push up a ceiling tile, there were, you know, stacks of bills hmm. all over the place. Right. It's like, mm -hmm. and they were like, you know, he was running a, he was running the original Papaya King store, but he was an NYU grad with, you know, like PhD level knowledge of the Napoleonic era. And so he <laughs> had these like metal Napoleon battle metal. Remember those metal soldiers, those antique oh, metal yeah. soldiers before they got became plastic, the green ones. Plastic we grew up with. Mm -hmm. But, but he, but he had these like Napoleonic war battle scenes in the basement of this hot dog restaurant. So again, <laughs> just super colorful. Yeah. 
God's was equally colorful in its own way, right? But, and, and you know, dining out, my, my wife still gives me a hard time. Is is I'm always kind of, it's, it's pleasure, but um, my analytical side kicks in, right? I'm kind of sure. Like, How could it not? There's this many people, <laughs> you know, that on that side of the counter, outside, wait, I don't see enough refrigeration for all this stuff. Where is it? There must be a bunker under here. So it was, it was really fun to kind of learn how they were putting on this big show. Mm -hmm. But my number one takeaway is back in 2013 was how meat and potato heavy it was. Mm. And as a result, the audience skewed male. Okay. And, you know, of course, coming in as a consultant, what am I doing? I'm interviewing employees and I'm interviewing guests and just trying to wrap my head around this concept and, you know, what makes it special and, and where the opportunities are to, to even make it better. And, you know, my mandate coming in, Sam, was really to kind of fortify the foundation. It was already there. Mm -hmm. and, to pos and to position the concept for some growth down the road. And before growing, um, I thought that it needed to be rounded out to, so that the menu had more mass appeal. Sure. Um, and, 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 and thereby differentiating it from all the other burger joints. Mm -hmm. So being in California, um, and, and one of the people I interviewed was Joel's wife, Sarah. Okay. And I said, so how many days a week do you eat at God's? And she goes, oh, I don't eat at God's. I'm like, what this is the founder's about? wife, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. And she goes, only when I have to. <laughs> and, and she said, listen, I'm, you know, a young mom. I'm a little bit of a health nut. Um, and I, you know. In my spare time, I like to do triathlons. And so she, you know, and, and there's a lot of that in Northern California, right? Yep. This was fascinating news for me. I'm like, wow. Um, what what do you like to eat, Sarah? Well, I, you know, I'm veg heavy. Um, try and I don't do a lot of carbs and fried foods or, you know, obviously a lot of people like them, but that's not what I'm looking for. So there was that drumbeat got loud quickly as I yeah. spoke, spoke with people. And so the first real kind of menu pivot we did was to develop this line of salads okay. um, and bringing, you know, California ingredients into it, like kale and quinoa, right. Which, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago was, wow, I can't believe this burger stand is serving kale and quinoa. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, overnight, is an exaggeration, but I use it, you know, with poetic license, right? Mm -hmm. Overnight, our market share started to increase mm. wow. because it is, it's really important to make sure there's something for everybody to eat. Right. And, yeah. and so, because guess what? It's 2023, but females are still dictating dining decisions for the majority of, of families. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. the way it is. Um, and there better be something for her to eat and there better be something for the kids to eat. Otherwise you're going to get vetoed as right. the destination. Right. I mean, I'll eat anything and I'm sure you will too. Yep. It's, mm -hmm. and, and I, and I think that's, you know, what a lot of America is like. And so, um, we made a concerted effort to make sure that the menu appealed more to, to everybody. And it's, it's paid dividends because yeah. it's just, you know, it all of a sudden, you know, groups come to us, right? Knowing that, I mean, if people are vegetarian, yeah, we can accommodate you, right? You have, you know, this allergy, we can accommodate you. It's so it's kind of one stop shop, in other words, for right. for groups, teams, um, even multi generational families. I, you know. Not to be crass, but, you know, we get a lot of multi-generational families, you know, elderly grandparents eating with yeah. grandkids. And, and you know, we have soup and chili. 
which is a little easier on the teeth. Mm -hmm. So, right. It's, and we have tiered price points like right now, Sam, I'm, don't mean to torture you, but <laughs> it's Dungeness crab season at Gots. Wow. And it's, I think it's, so, and that's a perfect example. I don't know any yeah. burger joints who are doing that, right? Like no. that's, I didn't mean to come up with that example, but <laughs> that's, that's an example of something that's just kind of a page out of the fine dining book. Right. But, you know, you're still getting this Dungeness crab sandwich that is unbelievably good and you need to plan some time out here in December. Um, mm -hmm. But it's served in a paper, but it's served in a paper boat. Mm. So elevated food served casually eaten at a picnic table with old friends or new friends, your, your choice, right? There's a lot of, I mean, we get a lot of, I mean, it's, we have people who've met at Gots who, you know, have gotten engaged at Gots and, and now we're hosting wedding receptions of those people. Like it's, it's a great feel good, um, memory making place. Right. Well, and going back to a point you made earlier, um, you know, with related to the menu, I mean, you, you have to take advantage of the bounty California provides. You're in the greatest agricultural state in the nation. So it's almost an embarrassment of riches yep. that must help you as you are innovating on the menu, I imagine. Totally. Um, it wasn't hard to, it's never hard to source things. Um, you know, supply chain got all wonky during the pandemic, sure. But um, we are fortunate um, as operators and consumers uh, to have really good year round produce. Um, and like you said, it's, it's a huge state. And so, you know, we do our best as a, as a company to source locally, whether it be produce or, you know, proteins. Um, and people appreciate that. Um, for sure. And, you know, it even goes to our, I mean, wine list, no surprise, California is a, a wine powerhouse domestically. Um, but even our beer list, um, are you a beer drinker, Sam? I sure am. So yep. are you, uh, familiar with Pliny the Elder? I very much am. And that, that's a hard to get beer. Yeah. So, you know, another pivot point as we've made the menu broader uh even before we started down the salad um product line one of the first calls i made was to russian river brewery mm. um to inquire about setting up accounts so that i could bring in pliny and some of their other selections Oh, you know, we're not opening up any new accounts. Um, and so I kind of said, okay, so what happens? Uh, nothing happens. You're SOL. Uh, we can put <laughs> you on a waiting list, right? I mean, it's a mm -hmm. fairly communistic arrangement, um, <laughs> at, at least back then, right? It's like, yeah. hmm, aren't you interested in selling beer? Um, but <laughs> everybody has their own culture, right? Mm -hmm. And um, And so... Oh, geez, five years went by. And then I was doing late night email warfare one Sunday night, and I get an email saying, thank you for your patience. We finally, um, you know, opened a new facility that can handle more production. Are you still interested? To wow. which I said, for sure. Not, you know, a lot of the beer world caught up to them because yeah. they didn't, they, you know, they just limited their supply I mean, they have their own approach whatever but sure so i wasn't sure it was going to be quite the thing but like you said and still even with that increased capacity there aren't that many places where you can get pliny the elder on draft um which is yet another reason to come to gods so mm. you know when i feel like one of my jobs is just to make sure that we're relevant right as a concept mm. and and make sure that we have what people want and mm -hmm. um but pliny was one of those unicorn menu items that brought kind of beer enthusiasts whether they were already got customers or not and so 
all of a sudden we ended up with a, a way more beer um, focused culture, literally because of it. Um, wow. And it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, mm -hmm. We, I know because, you know, it's been so successful at Gotts that now we're very friendly with the Russian river people um, <laughs> because we've got eight units. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we sell more, we sell more plane than anybody outside of their own tap rooms. That's amazing. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a badge of honor. So, so you have a reason to come in December for crab. Mm -hmm. You've got a reason to come for Pliny um, every month of the year. So we hope to see you soon, Sam. <laughs> I know. I was telling my wife uh, ahead of this interview, I'm like, uh, we got to get back to Napa pretty soon, actually. Uh, Going to plan that for 24 for sure. But, you know, it's interesting because um, you mentioned this point, I mean, about the veto vote. And I imagine in Napa, I mean, you're getting bachelorette parties, bachelor parties, family reunions. Um, I imagine your average ticket or your average group size, I must imagine skews maybe bigger than most restaurants because – and of course, that St. Helena location has a giant yard, which is great for large groups. I, I'm just wondering, does it skew that you get bigger parties because of just the nature of Napa in general? It does, but it's very seasonal. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, there's, our, our Napa, I mean, weather matters for gods. Mm -hmm. um, just because of the importance of the outdoor element for, for what we're all about. Um we still do plenty of volume during the winter time, especially, um, you know, when our locations are by an arena or by a busy shopping area that, you know, really, really peaks this time of year. Mm -hmm. So we are somewhat diversified. Um, but, but it's, it's, um, there are those different challenges during different times of year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so talking about scaling, you know, you want to grow this brand, uh, from the eight locations it has today. Um, but you know, all of this that we've talked about is, you know, makes me think how much GOTS is rooted in place. It's rooted in emotion. Like we've talked about uh, in my sake, it's really rooted in, in memory. Right. And, and right. I imagine that is a blessing and a curse because blessing First thing I'm doing when I'm in Napa, I'm going to God's curse. You, it's a little bit lightning in a bottle, right? It's a little bit harder yeah. to recreate that, to turn this into some sort of cookie cutter, um, which of course I'm sure you don't want to do, but, but how do you scale something that is so rooted in this experience and rooted in place? And you yourself talk about wine country picnic concept, which is by the way, perfect. I love that, but you can't just drop that into Ohio, you can't just drop that into any old state. Tell me about how you scale a concept like this while protecting really what it's all about. Yeah, we've been fairly cautious. Um, you know, we've opened up five units in 10 years. Um, and we're interested in, in opening some more for sure. But we're definite, definitely not, to your point, a mass market brand. Mm -hmm. Right. I feel like we're more of a cottage brand. Um, interestingly, we we have loyal followers from all 50 states. Mm -hmm. And we know that because during the pandemic, we started a relationship with Gold Belly, um, the nationwide shipper of, of fine foods. Um, and, you know, one way for us to enable people to relive their Napa Valley experience is by sent and, and what we have are cheeseburger kits. So we haven't, you know, we, we don't have a whole bunch of different menu offerings, but it's just one. Um, but you'd be blown away at how many people, I mean, order these things to, to just re try and recreate some, you know, lunch they had in the wine country when they were visiting the Bay area. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're larger, 
concepts with the breadth of menu that we have is a lot harder to scale than say an in and out burger, um, you know, five item menu, right? Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, a lot can go wrong. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we're, we've tried to really foster a culture of hospitality at God's and, and really the baseline is, is a great training program and, and opportunity for professional development and career advancement. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, that's translated into um, less turnover and just, you know, more dedication to making work at GOTS a career as opposed to just a stopping point. Sure, we get plenty of college kids seasonally, um, like all restaurants do, but we have um, a, a really incredible team that's skilled and, and, and like-minded. And, and we've become one of the most desirable places to work in our market because of just the workplace vibe mm -hmm. and, and the ability to, to make a good living because of the volume we do. So it's kind of, um, that that's a great baseline. So landlords like us because we're really clean operators. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, in mixed use developments, we lift all boats around us too, right? because we have our own following that we can bring to the table. But yep. then we benefit from like at the ferry building where, you know, there's the biggest farmer's market in the area. You know, we like to hitch our wagon to something bigger than us mm -hmm. and land. And those landlords like it because we bring our own followers wherever we go. So in terms of growth, you know, we've been opportunistic, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of what I call long, long lead sales generation where, you know, we've got a map of the Bay area with little pins on where we'd like to be. Um, and we're really patient. And then when, you know, and not really trade area specific, not building specific. Um, but when a compelling opportunity comes along that meets our criteria, then we seize that opportunity. Um, and so, you know, we'll continue to do that. I think, um, you know, I brought up the fact that we've got fans in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. along, with, along with that comes, oh, would you please come to, you know, suburban Atlanta? We, we, we would be there every night. You know, it's like, it is very um, <sighs> flattering. Right. Yeah. It's really flattering. Um, and, but I know from, you asked me about lessons learned from prior experience. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to manage from afar. Mm -hmm. um, right. It's just, it's kind of like what happened to the British in the American colonies. Right. Yeah. Um, the frontiers uh, were the first to uh, become independent thinkers and do things their own way. Um, mm -hmm. And, and for an in, independent restaurant, that's fine because there's no accountability to being consistent with other locations. But we're a chain of restaurants that are the exact same concept. And so for us, consistency is really king. That's why you're yeah. not going to see us try and grow too quickly because we don't want to fall on our face. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I will say... Um, Southern California is very tempting in many ways for us because 70% of the state lives down there. Hmm. So the, the density is there while there is more competition, there isn't really anything like what we do under one roof. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we, we quantify where our out of town guests are coming from as best we can. Mm -hmm. um, and, Believe it or not, it's in-state tourism. We get it all. We get international tourism too, but, and it's not surprising. LA right. is the biggest city in the country. Yeah. So that's a lot of people. And that's just, mm -hmm. doesn't count, you know, Orange County or San Diego County, right? So 
and people can drive. And so, right. um, you know, I, I think whereas we have a big, you know, big following in New York because a lot of people travel back and forth. Um, it's, it's people find us, not everybody finds us in the wine country anymore because we've got like a Palo Alto location, which is really part of Silicon Valley. So yeah. sometimes people find us there, right? Um, which is cool. People find us different ways. And we've got this airport location um, in the international terminal, mm. which always, always, we get a lot of great feedback there because um, when people visit the Bay Area, there's a good chance that they visited a Gotts along the way somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they go to, you know, fly home and they're like, Oh my God, <laughs> they're here too. We get to, we get to do this again. Mm -hmm. um, which is, which is kind of cool. I mean, we didn't really plan that. It's just, that's where we've gotten the most praise is just, we had a great experience at one of your street level locations and wow, what a, a great surprise on the way out of town. We can't wait to come yeah. back type of thing. So, you know, it's a feel good. And, and I imagine speaking of all this and considering competition, I mean, I imagine really the scarcity principle is at, principle is at play here and, and not to pick on them, but I think of, about Shake Shack and I think about the fact that once upon a time, and you would know this better than anybody because you were probably in New York when Shake Shack first opened. I mean, you, you, yeah. you p made a pilgrim pilgrimage to Shake Shack. It was a destination. And now it's in most communities in America. And while it's a fine burger choice and I have nothing against Shake Shack, it's not special like it used to be when it was just, you know, five, six, seven locations in New York City. To some degree, I think that's where, where In-N-Out over 80 years has very slowly expanded because they're trying to protect that, right? So I imagine that's at play here, that scarcity principle of you, you ruin it if you go to Atlanta, right? Well, that's the million dollar question. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are competing forces. Mm -hmm. um, we live in, you know, a capitalistic market driven economy. Right. And so, you know, we're all taught uh, bigger is better. Um, and, you know, market penetration is king and, you know, all these things. So um, I think that would be I forgot given the breadth of menu. And um, I, I just think franchising would be the way to to go to far off locations. But the problem with franchising is then you're relinquishing control of your your concept in many ways, yeah. and don't have the same um, control over food quality and and service standards and and stuff like that. So I think we'll probably keep it closer to home. Mm -hmm. um, but we also reserve the right to change our mind too, right? It's just, it's kind of, it all depends on, on what the opportunity is and, and, you know, where ownership is, etc. cetera. But yeah. we have plenty to keep our, keep us busy in California for sure. Yeah, um, big enough state. <laughs> so we'll see, right? No, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, 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 um, it's, there's plenty of traffic mm -hmm. um, and it's just, you know, it just comes down to where we want to operate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. So Clay, last question for you. Um, you know, a lot of people who listen to this podcast are emerging brands, um, startup brands, you know, about the size of GOTS, regional brands. I always like to ask, you know, for, for one kind of practical tip that um, our guests can provide and and considering you're in you know you've had 30 years of experience in the food service industry you're overseeing this eight unit brand that has a rich history and incredible following and you want to grow i'm just curious what would be some tips you would give to you know others who are kind of in that same boat of growing an emerging concept they've got a special idea and they're just trying to figure out what to do about it any kind of tips you can provide that audience so when I contemplated jumping into this business, I reached out to other people I knew that were already established in the business. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate that a couple of my high school classmates had very, very successful 
fathers in the business um, who have since been my mentors my whole life. Right. Mm. When I, so of course, first meeting, you don't want to go into this business <laughs> right? across the board. Mm -hmm. And so I have made that recommendation to a lot of people. Yeah. Right. But if you do get into the business, let me know and give me a call. So, you know, <laughs> I like to, you know, caution people up front mm -hmm. because it's very volatile. Um, it's not for everybody. It's, um, but I, you know, I got reeled back into it after my real estate stint and I, you know, I can't, I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there are days when I re-question what I'm doing because <laughs> when it rains, it pours in terms of, you know, challenges, especially over the last five years. Um, but, you know, my advice is to lean on personal networks, mm. um, you know, solicit advice from, from peers. Um, that's because, you know, that collective knowledge um, is, is very grounding. Um, there's risk in the business, but you, you can mitigate risk by um, taking a conservative approach business-wise even though, you know, you may be um, avant-garde when it comes to, you know, the menu offering that you, you're trying to lead with. And, right. you know, it's all about market timing, mm. um, I would also say. And, and that's something that I share with, with other people in the business. I mean, we all acknowledge, if you're in the business, you acknowledge it because it's everybody's had that experience, right? You know, like with the Emerald planet, it being first is not always best. Mm. So because along with being first comes the onus of educating the consumer, right? About what the hell you're serving and what you want them to try. Yeah. And if they've never had it before, right, then it's a stretch. And when you don't, when you're a startup and don't have a marketing budget, well, I mean, you don't have a budget for anything, right? You're just mm -hmm. living hand to mouth. It's really hard to solicit trial um, because in our business, it's all about repeat business. That's, right. you know, hey, airports and amusement parks can sell, you know, there's less concern there, right? Because mm -hmm. it's so transient. But you know, in, in neighborhoods that doesn't fly, right. There has right. to be a value proposition. Um, and you know, I would encourage people to revisit their value proposition, um, as, as operators, especially, you know, in the under 10 unit, um, area, because, you know, people on the street probably don't realize it, but we're innovating constantly. Mm. Um, and, and that's part of the fun. Yeah. You know, we have, I, I, I try, I tried most of my career before Gots. I tried to be different, too different. At Gots, we've got this Americana that is kind of, um, what everybody wants as a baseline to, it, you know, it's comforting to people. Um, it's, you know, people kind of drop their, their other social allegiances, you know, with, with our bipartisan political environment, you know, it's, it's just continuing to, to get wider and angrier. Um, right. it, it's interesting that people leave that in the car mm. and they come, I mean, you know, it's a diverse, we have a diverse crowd and you know we're we're agnostic right it's like mm -hmm. it's about removing barriers to mass appeal and making sure that there's something for everyone now along with that means you're not going to open up 30 restaurants next year like if you're if 
you're looking for, you know, mass scale, then you have to go narrow. But, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, our approach is, has been just very methodical, um, you know, have seasonal specials to keep interest in our brand up. Um, and it, it creates pent up demand. It's like our, our rate, our daily menu is, is diverse, but then we, we, you know, put Dungeness crab, um, on the menu in December and January. And, you know, from my New York days, I, you know, we needed a chicken parm sandwich. I mean, come on. And, right. you know, and then we've got this, um, you know, we serve this whole corn on the cob, um, street corn with, uh, it's kind of inspired by, you know, Mexico city with cotilla cheese and mm. fresh squeezed lime. And so, I mean, you walk in through our dining rooms, um, during corn season and people are just non on husks of corn and it, it's just an <laughs> incredible thing. It's like, we're a burger joint, but we're not. And so, yeah. you know, it's try to find points of differentiation without being too extreme is, is kind of my advice because yeah. not everybody, not everybody wants Dungeness crab. A it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, B it's from the sea. Um, not everybody rolls that way, but so, right. Hey, we still have, we still have the hot dog if that's your bag. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of, we sell a, a, a scary number of hot dogs. I mean, <laughs> and it's not one of our biggest movers, but sometimes that's what people want, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of been our, the secret to our success is just quality across the board, but diversity of menu so that there's something for everybody. And, and that means God's is always a good time. Oh, that's great. I love that. And uh, a good time I hope to have in 2024. <laughs> I'm coming out to your way, Clay, in 2024. <laughs> So Sam, yeah, we are having a 25th anniversary party. Okay, that you will be getting an invitation to in September. Love it, love it. September 2024. Um, which, yes. So we don't. We're going to push a save the date after we land on the date. Um, <laughs> but that's coming up here really quickly. Um, you know, I, that'll be announced in January. Um, so just an extra reason to make That's the right. pilgrimage. That's um, right. Didn't need but, another one, but yeah, I'll we'd, take it. <laughs> we'd love right. No, hey, it's just hey, it makes it easier. Um, That's right. And as you know, you know, September is the best time of year in the northern hemisphere. So it's true. You know, it's it's post it's post peak summer tourism after Labor Day. But you know, out in Cal I mean, in most places, it's just still really nice weather and yeah. Um, please come join us. We'll have a great time. I'm planning on it. Clay Walker, president of God's Roadside. Thanks right. for your time today. I really appreciate it. Sam, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. That was my interview with Gotts Roadside President Clay Walker. So what should you learn from this interview? Here are my six takeaways. My first takeaway is that you shouldn't be afraid to fail because your biggest success might still be ahead of you. Clay has a really interesting career being in food service really for almost 30 years now, as he said, and that includes a lot of different experiences in this industry. That includes being an entrepreneur, that includes being involved in supply chain and in being involved in partnerships. He got a lot of different experiences at different companies, um, but especially at Emerald City, that the brand that he founded in the 90s in New York City, it ultimately failed. And Clay emphasized that it, if it weren't for going through that failure, he wouldn't be the leader he is today. You know, there's a famous phrase that you should fail fast and that everybody is going to fail. So you want to go through that process, learn from that process, because ultimately you can be refined by that process. Um, and in Clay's case, that is absolutely the truth and that it led him to Gott's Roadside and what he's been able to do with this brand. Keep it in mind for yourself that you may fail, yes, but a failure can only lead to bigger and better things uh, if you can learn from it and if you can have the right mindset when it comes to that failure. 
My second takeaway is that counter service and picnic tables are perfectly acceptable for elevated food. Uh, some of the menu items at GOTS are more what you might expect at a casual dining restaurant or even a fine dining restaurant. Uh, Clay talked about that Dungeness crab sandwich that they're currently serving as a sinu- seasonal menu option. Uh, those those uh, uh, menu items, they might not be what you would expect from a counter service restaurant, which is what GOTS is. Uh, but they pull off this balance so well. If you go to a GOTS or if you've been to one, you'll notice that the menu is incredible, the hospitality is great, the restaurants are clean, and they feel even fancy. Um, But yes, they are picnic tables, and it is a counter service restaurant. Um, And all of this feels exactly as it should be. Roadside, that uh, word in the Gotts Roadside name, I mean, that's an important part of the brand, that it feels like a walk-up window of yesteryear. And they emphasize that point with the counter service, with the picnic tables, but they don't let that be an excuse to serve less than great food. My third takeaway is that if you want to be all things to all people, open where they live, work, and play. Gots has been very methodical in its approach to growth. And as I'll get into a little bit, you know, Clay explained that there's a very opportunistic approach that they take uh, to growth. But also, they're looking for a very specific neighborhood type of restaurant that exists in this place where consumers are living and working and playing. And Clay explained that by doing that, they, you know, they do have this menu where they can be all things to all people. They can really maximize the, uh, the accomplishments of the restaurant and the potential of the restaurant. But they're looking for that exact location that's going to afford them the ability to do what they're hoping to do with GOTS. Sometimes restaurants might only be designed for where customers work. Other restaurants might be only designed for where they play. But, you know, if you're if you've got a big menu and if you are all of these things to all people, which is not a a bad thing, you still need to find those locations that are going to be where customers are spending the majority of their time, which is where they live and they work and they play. Not a lot of those locations out there. And again, we'll get into that sort of slow, methodic growth approach that they're taking. Um, But that is what you have to look for if that's how you want to grow. My fourth takeaway is that if you want to be the best at what you do, learn to be patient. Gott's Roadside is all about the quality that they offer their customers. They want to be the best at their food, at their drink, at their experience. Um, But they've only grown to eight locations in 25 years. Uh, And there's a reason for that, as I just hinted at. They're very opportunistic with their growth. They don't want to just open up wherever they can. And the reason for that is because they're a very distinct experience. They have that wine country aesthetic. As Clay says, they want to bottle that up and take that everywhere they go. And that's not going to work in your traditional uh, strip center, as Clay said. It has to work in a very specific location. So they have to be patient. He says they have a map with pins all over it uh, around the Bay Area of where they would like to grow. And then they wait for those opportunities to arise, and then they seize those opportunities. That is a patient approach to growth. It's not you know, going to be for everybody because some people want to grow faster than that. But that patience ultimately pays off when they get the location that they can excel in and that is the best uh, for the GOTS brand, which is really all built around quality. There's another story Clay told in our conversation that I really appreciated, which is around how they got that Pliny the Elder beer from Russian, Russian River Brewing. If you know anything about beer, you know that once upon a time, still today, this is a fantastic beer, but once upon a time, it was sort of a storied beer of how popular, uh, how much demand uh, it had because of how good it was and yet how little there was of it to go around. Clay told that story of how he called up Russian River to see if they could get some, got on a waiting list, and it was five years before they were able to get Pliny the Elder in the Gotts Roadside stores. Now, though, as he said, uh, Gotts is the largest account to his knowledge outside of Russian River tap rooms for that particular beer, and Gotts has become a destination for Pliny the Elder beer. That patience paid off, and they're able to provide one of the best beers out there to their customers. If you want to be the best at what you do, learn to be patient, and that patience will pay off. 
My fifth takeaway is that timing is everything with succeeding as a brand. Um, Clay tells the story of how he opened his first restaurant in New York, Emerald City, and how the timing didn't work because the menu wasn't, it didn't really exist yet for customers, burritos and smoothies. Of course, now everybody knows about them, but in the 90s, nobody did. They were so early to market that the timing just didn't work out. Probably if they opened today, they would have done great. Um, but as he said, you know, for those of you in uh, that have emerging restaurant brands that you want to build up, just know that you don't necessarily want to be on the bleeding edge because you're going to have to do a lot of education for customers and it just might become overly cumbersome. Simultaneously, you have to strike while the iron is hot. Um, and, and all of this means that you have to position your brand in front of the customers exactly when they want your product. There's no science to this and it's not exact. Um, it really is following your intuition and understanding the market trends um, and market forces at play. But if you can get the timing right, if you can get your brand and product in front of the people when they most want it, then that could be the accelerator you need as a brand. My sixth and final takeaway is that restaurants are about emotion, are, are as much about emotions and memories as they are food and drink. Now, I nerded out a little bit in this conversation, as you could probably tell, because GOT has a very special place in my heart. I've been there several times, and my first time that I went there, I went with my wife and my daughter, who is now seven, but at the time was only seven months. And we went to the St. Helena location in California. They have this gorgeous yard, and we spent this wonderful afternoon, um, very casual time with you know beers, a picnic blanket for our daughter. Um, and I have this very distinct memory of how beautiful that day was and how wonderful that trip was, and we all were having a great time. And every time I have been back to Napa and uh, the, the region there, I've gone back to Gott because that was such a distinct memory for me that evokes so much positive emotion that I want to go and recreate it. Of course, all of you listening have restaurants that are exactly like that. You have your favorite restaurants that are as much about that experience and memory you had there as they are about the great food that you can get there. And I bring all this up to say, you can create that for your own customers. How can you be that restaurant to your guests? Create those memories that uh, evoke emotion from your guests and make them want to come back whenever they're passing by or whenever they are in town. Gots is all about a wine country picnic experience, as Clay said. They are trying to bottle that up. And the reason they're doing that is because those words, even when I say them, you probably had some sort of thought about what that means. It evokes that emotion. Your restaurant should be all about evoking emotion, creating memories to play that special role in your guests' lives. Those are all my takeaways for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe to Takeaway wherever you listen to podcasts and leave your feedback. You can also email me at sam.okus at informa.com. Thanks again and talk to you next week.